Welcome to Bitchy History, the irreverent history podcast that thinks if we'd just let women handle everything in the past, we'd probably be a lot better off today. Welcome back to Bitchy History. Can you believe that you've actually gotten two episodes in two weeks? I almost can't believe it myself, but hopefully this means I am actually back on track. For today's topic, I wanted to get back out of the 20th century since almost all the episodes this season have been focused on that period. I mean, look, I love the 20th century and most of my research interests focus on the 1950s and later in America, but the 19th century has a lot of unexplored history when it comes to women as well. We mostly tend to focus on men during this period. It's a very rugged time period in most of our minds. With westward expansion and the Civil War and the robber barons of the Gilded Age, women seem like they were just fading into the background like an extra in a movie. But women in the 19th century were just as vibrant as they are now, and they did it in the face of even more systemic inequalities working against them. So for today, we're going to be talking about a period that's been almost entirely dominated by men in the narrative the homesteading of the West. I'm definitely dating myself with this reference, but one of the shows I remember watching the most as a kid was Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. I grew up with no cable, so channels like PBS and the three big networks were the ones I got, and CBS was one of the stations we had access to through our antenna. Yes, I'm old. But I'm not actually as old as you might think, hearing that I used to use a rabbit ear antenna that had tinfoil on it. Uh, My family was also poor, so we were always about a decade out of date with technology when I was growing up. The series, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, starts in 1867 when Dr. Michaela Quinn is traveling west to Colorado Springs to set up her own medical practice in the frontier. I don't honestly remember a lot of the plot or historical setting for this series. I was very young when I watched it, but as a historian, I find the premise of the series extremely interesting, and I'd like to think that at least some historical research was put into the concept. Mostly because I know reviewers hated it. They called it primetime hokum and too politically correct, starring a politically correct frontier feminist that was filled with a pacifist, multicultural, ecological feminist contraption so sanctimonious it could chase a left winger into Rush Limbaugh's arms. Those are all actual quotes from reviewers of the show. Arlene Eaton, a professor at American University, clarifies the problem these critics seem to have with the series. By political correctness, the critics mean that in its very acknowledgement of the existence of historical systemic injustice and its inclusion of plot lines about emancipated, formerly enslaved people, indigenous people, and immigrants, the show is imposing a liberal, modern sensibility upon the past. Except that all of those things existed, and people definitely existed who believed in equality and freedom and systemic injustice even then, and in fact, I'd argue many of them would have found themselves in the West. The problem critics seemed to have was that Dr. Quinn was representing a more accurate, diverse history of America rather than the John Wayne movies they preferred. Eaton comments on this in her article as well. In this case, the critiques seem partly a complaint of genre. Dr. Quinn is a Western. American Westerns, a historically conservative genre, have often worked to maintain the white patriarchal status quo. But it's also a complaint regarding the gender dynamics that characterize the show. The critics weren't just rebuking an anachronistically progressive Western, they were specifically protesting the progressive values espoused by a woman starring in a Western. The problem here seems to be that the image of the Old West that we all had was one where women played little to no independent role. So the very concept of a show about an independent, unmarried woman on the frontier making her own way felt anachronistic and impossible. Except independent women making their own way, whether a doctor or a gambler or a prospector on the American frontier, is an entirely historically accurate possibility. Not just plausible, but relatively commonplace in the time period in which Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman was set. Movement into the Western frontier had started very early in the 19th century. Lewis and Clark's expedition searching for a water route to the Pacific is the most famous push west, but they were hardly the first to set their eyes on the frontier. Fur traders and explorers had been pushing west for a long time before that. But it isn't until after Lewis and Clark's expedition that we begin to see people migrating in bulk, with the largest push coming during the California Gold Rush of 1848 to 1855. 
Now, the gold rush was dominated by men, but it was by no means only men who went west during this period. About 3% of the travel to California before 1850 was made up of women, something like 3,500 women to 115,000 men. Many of these were women of color, but as word got back to the East Coast of job opportunities for women, more women began to migrate west, and these were not merely women coming to the west with their husbands. Many of them were independent women making their own way. Now, of course, the job opportunities for women in the West weren't always the best. Two of the major job opportunities for women were found in sex work and entertainment. Often those two had a lot of crossover. Now, I'm not here to judge sex workers, so my comment on that not being the best job has nothing to do with a moral judgment of their profession, only the working conditions that they usually found themselves in. In 1850s Gold Rush, California, there were little to no laws prohibiting or regulating sex work, and women were in short supply. Madams who ran their own brothels were common, and some of them became incredibly prosperous, such as Madame Lou Graham, who became one of the wealthiest citizens of Seattle, and, depending on who you ask, might have stopped the entire Seattle economy from collapsing during the bank crisis of 1893. I'll undoubtedly be revisiting Madame Lou in a future episode, because she's a fascinating figure, and opens a door to discuss some very interesting factors of the progressive era and women's suffrage movements. But this episode isn't actually about prostitution, though that certainly was a major factor in employing women in the American West during this period. We're here to talk about homesteading, so let's fast forward a bit from the gold rush of the 1850s to the Homesteading Act of 1862. As a side note, I won't be discussing the downsides of westward expansion in this episode. Let's leave it as a given for now that it, what was done in the name of Manifest Destiny was a vicious act of colonialism, white supremacy, and both cultural and literal genocide. I'll revisit that topic in the future, but for now, let's stay on the topic of how homesteading and westward expansion affected women, especially single women. That's not to say, of course, that married women didn't play a major role in settling the West, but often the reluctant wife of a starry-eyed man with dreams of staking his claim is the image that we have of women during this period, dragged along by their husband's dreams when they would much rather have stayed in a more civilized world. Personally, I blame Little House on the Prairie for this, the book, not the television series. Ma was hardly depicted as a fragile woman, but she definitely wasn't the one enamored with moving West. In the long winter evenings, he talked to Ma about the western country. In the west, the land was level, and there were no trees. The grass grew thick and high. There the wild animals wandered and fed as though they were in a pasture that stretched much further than a man could see, and there were no settlers. Only Indians lived there. One day, in the very last of the winter, Pa said to Ma, Seeing you don't object, I've decided to go see the West. I've had an offer for this place, and we can sell it now for as much as we're ever likely to get, enough to give us a start in a new country. Oh, Charles, must we go now? Ma said. The weather was so cold, and the snug house was so comfortable. In her 1972 article, Women Homesteaders on the Great Plains Frontier, Cheryl Patterson Black wrote about the stereotype of women on the frontier. In one early account, Marion Colt Davis describes her family's Western migration, in which, in rapid succession, she lost her husband and child to epidemic. Devastated, remorseful, and exhausted, she hastily retreated to her point of origin, and there her memoirs end. Marion Colt Davis is typical of the image of women as reluctant pioneer, a stereotypic image which is perpetuated by history books, or at least not destroyed by them. However, this image is refuted by my study of homestead women. For some time, I have been concerned with the historic image of women on the frontier, the stereotype that would have us believe that most women in the West in the 19th century had followed men and were prostitutes, dance hall girls, or dependent helpless wives accompanying their husbands. The image of women as reluctant pioneers has long been popular and entirely accepted. In fact, little or no evidence of the contrary has been readily available. During the duration of the Homestead Act, 1862 to 1934, would-be farmers claimed hundreds of millions of acres of land in the West. As it turns out, thousands of these homesteaders were women, a hidden force on the agricultural frontier. Women were moving West not just as long-suffering wives, but as single women in search of their own fortunes. The Homesteading Act of 1862 made that possible. 
The Homestead Act of 1862 stated that any person who is the head of a family or has arrived at the age, age of 21 years and is a citizen of the United States or who shall have filled his declaration of intention to become such as required by the naturalization laws of the United States was entitled to claim up to 160 acres of surveyed government land. Claimants were required to live on and improve their plot by cultivating the land. Any person. Not any man. That's the key here. Now, of course, the person making the claim had to be their head of household, meaning this excluded married women, but single women and widows were legally eligible to make these claims, and make them they did. Make no mistake, Congress didn't do this because they had suddenly decided that women were people too. To quote Hannah Hoxgard's article, including unmarried women in the Homestead Act of 1862, where she writes, Most congressional members who supported including unmarried women did so because women were a necessary part of empire building. Women were expected to marry, bear children, and engage in building permanent communities. The most common argument for allowing unmarried women to claim homesteads was because these women were viewed as potential wives and mothers. In 1852, Representative Joseph Cable argued for including maidens who shall become wedded once on the frontier. In 1854, Senator William Dawson also explicitly framed the issue as one of procreation. He argued for giving land to every girl in order to increase population by reproduction. In fact, some of the supporters of allowing women to claim land under the Homestead Act did so believing that women would actually be incapable of successful homesteading. But hey, once the ladies were out west, they would need husbands. And once they realized how foolish their dreams of homesteading independently were, they'd probably just get married and settle down to churn out American babies to populate the frontier. Right? Right? Actually, it turned out that women were kind of better at homesteading than Congress thought. Possibly better than men, in fact. It's estimated that between 11% and 20% of homesteaders in Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, North and South Dakota, Utah, and Idaho were single women, and the rate of gaining title or proving their, their claim was much higher among women than if it was for men. Who's shocked? Not me. Returning to Patterson Black's article, her study of government records found that an average of 11.9% of the sample of homestead entrants that she studied were women, and that of those who filed homestead entry, 37% of men succeeded in making a final claim to their land, while 42.4% of the women succeeded in the same. The majority of homesteading women were young, single, and interested in adventure and the possibility of economic gain. And in search of this, they went west, and they left behind documentation, not just of the legal claims they made on property, though there are many of those in the archives as well, but their own recollection of their reasons for homesteading. Florence Blake Smith, a Chicago bookkeeper, wrote that she learned about homesteading from a friend just before he set out for Wyoming. Her response to this was, if he could do it, I could too. Lucy Goldthorpe told how she got caught up in the excitement of the times. Even if you hadn't inherited a bit of restlessness and a pioneering spirit, it would have been difficult to ward off the excitement of the boom. Nellie Burgess, a 31-year-old from Chicago, said that she was persuaded by the call of the outdoors to give up her reporter's job and file a claim in Idaho near the Snake River. Pauline Shoemaker remarked, I've done everything else. I might as well try homesteading. Louise Carlson was looking for a good investment. When in 1908 I heard about the homestead land one could get, I thought, here's my chance. Helen Coburn dropped out of college to homestead in Wyoming with a female friend. They filed on adjoining land and shared a shack that straddled their property line. Helen was Warland's first school teacher until Ashby Howell, owner of the town's general store, courted and wed her. But many women who homesteaded had no interest in marriage. Alice Newberry wrote to her mother that marriage seemed unattractive because cooking three meals a day, 365 days a year for the term of my natural life for a man is more than I can face. Another South Dakota homesteader told a Collier's reporter that her life had seemed empty when she lived in a spacious home. Now I have my 10 by 12 house, my yellow land, and my freedom, and I think that life contains everything. But it wasn't just young women who were staking their claims. Many widows, some with children and some without, came west as well. Daniel Freeman has long been hailed in history and written about as the first homesteader to make a claim in Nebraska Territory in 1863, January 1st, the first day the claim office was open. 150 years later, some enterprising scholar found the records of Mary Meyer, the first female homesteader in Nebraska, who filed her claim only days after Freeman. 
and Mary apparently kicked ass at being a homesteader. Mary Meyer was a widow, which allowed her to be the head of household on her claim, and she never remarried. Instead, she successfully proved up her claim in the required five years, and documents show that she had a large 16 by 26 foot house, fruit trees, grapevines, a well, a chicken coop, a corn crib, a corral and livestock, and 35 cultivated acres. One of her documents that verified her homestead improvements was signed by a witness, Daniel Freeman. Their claims were right next to each other. Another widow was Montana's first female homesteader, Gwynlian Evans, who immigrated from Wales to the United States in 1868 and filed her claim in 1870 on land that would later become the town of Opportunity, Montana. She proved up her claim in 1872 and would become one of the territory's first postmistresses. She lived on her homestead until the day she died in 1892. Martha Stoker Norby became a homesteader by the invitation of her brother George. George informed Martha of a trip he was about to take to Pierre, South Dakota with a group of friends. They planned to look at homestead land with the intention of filing claims. George's letter took Martha by surprise when it invited her to become one of the party. Initially, Martha thought the idea rather interesting, but after giving it more thought, she concluded, what a thrill it would be to own 160 acres of land I had acquired by my own efforts. She would write a memoir in which it becomes clear that she was one of the single women who, unlike her brother, would go on to successfully prove up her claim. At the end of two years, Brother George decided to give up his claim, but I went out in the spring of 1906 to live all by myself. When I started living there, there weren't any single women on claims near there, but single men and women came fast that spring, also married couples. People were curious about me living alone, and the boys called me the freak. My favorite bit from her memoir is this. One morning, I took my cot outside, thought I'd sit there and write to my parents. I got sleepy and laid down and slept. When I awoke, there was a big rattler coiled up on top of the bank of dirt thrown up against the shack, rattling like fury, about 10 or 12 feet away. I was frightened, got up and went outside and loaded my rifle. I took aim and fired, hit it in the middle and how it rattled and hissed. I waited a little while until I was calm and quit shaking and then fired again and blew its head to bits. I took the hoe and chopped the rattles off. There were nine. I still have them. I never slept outdoors again after that. In truth, the Homestead Act was not the first act to allow women some modicum of property rights. The 1849 California Constitution provided that all property, both real and personal, of the wife owned or claimed by her before marriage, and that acquired afterwards by gift, device, or descent, would remain her separate property, which was already a pretty hefty shift in favor of women's rights. This language in the California Constitution reflected the language of the Texas Constitution, which had been heavily influenced by Spanish-based legal systems, which I believe I've mentioned in previous episodes, had always tended towards a certain level of fiscal and property rights for women, unlike the English common law, which influenced so much of the early northern states. Not everyone was pleased by California's decision. One delegate warned against giving women property rights based on what he'd seen living in France. I have lived some years in countries where the civil law prevails and where a separate right of property is given to the wife. If there is any country in the world which presents the spectacle of domestic disunion more than another, it is France. There, the husband and wife are partners in business, raising the wife from head clerk to partner. The very principle is contrary to nature and contrary to the married state. Nice. We don't care. Not that supporters of giving women property rights were complimentary to women, either. We are told, Mr. Chairman, that a woman is a frail being, that she is formed by nature to obey and ought to be protected by her husband, who is her natural protector. That is true, sir. But is there anything in all this to impair her right of property, which she possessed previous to entering into the marriage contract? I contend not. Thanks, I guess? And that's not to mention the one dude who basically said, there aren't enough women here, so I can't find a wife, and we need to convince women to move here so I can get laid. It's not the most egalitarian reason in the world to give women property rights, but sometimes we have to take what we can get. The West offered a new opportunity to women, regardless of why the men reluctantly extended that opportunity, and women took full advantage of it. Under the Morrill Act of 1862, for instance, it became possible for states to establish public colleges funded by the development or sale of associated federal land grants. Many states and territories in the West began to establish land-grant colleges which specialized in practical pursuits like agriculture. 
Land-grant colleges like Oregon State, Utah State, and the University of Nebraska would become some of the very first public schools in the world to promote co-education of both men and women. By 1872, the American West boasted 67 of the nation's 97 co-ed schools. It was the women of the Wyoming Territory who would be the first to gain the right to vote, and prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment, many of the states that already offered women the right to vote were found in the West. The West gave us the first woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, Jeanette Rankin from Montana, the first female governors, Nellie Taylor Ross of Wyoming and Miriam Ferguson of Texas, and the first woman mayor of a major city, Seattle's Bertha Knight Landis. Homesteading women created an atmosphere where ideas about women's rights could flourish. For all the wrongs of westward expansion, at least something good came of it. Though, looking at America's day, I have to wonder how much we've really progressed since then. After all, most politicians still think of women as just baby-making factories, so not much has changed in America. I guess I'll have to take a page from the memoir of Martha Stoker Norby and keep a loaded rifle around. Just in case. You know, for rattlesnakes, that's all. Thank you for tuning in once more to hear me bitch about history. I've had two proposals to present research at conferences next year accepted. I'm very excited about it. If you're interested in helping me fund my trips to these conferences in March and April, there's a link on the Bitchy History substack to a fundraiser I'm running. I have to say a huge thank you to the first listener to donate, which happens to be my dear friend Dr. Stormer from Johns Hopkins, who has been a huge supporter of my work and research. He's an absolute star. Today is the last day of the semester, and I'm almost entirely caught up on grading as well, which is spectacular and almost never happens. I'll be spending much of my winter break prepping for a new course for next semester, American History 1945 to Present, which makes me all the happier that I did this topic now, as I foresee more 20th century history featuring on the podcast for the next few weeks. See you back here on Thursday for more bitchy history.